Morning Revolution and welcome to Good Morning Revolution. I hope everybody's doing good this morning. We're running a little late, but we're here nevertheless, Scott and Rosanna and Michael. Good morning, Revolution. Ooh. We morning, prevail. Revolution. <laughs> Anita, Anita has the day off. She's visiting with family in the sunny state of Florida. So we hope she's having a good visit and let's get started. A lot happened this week. There's war in the East and in the West, Mr. Biden gave the State of the Union. And we're gonna be talking about that uh, and all of the things that came up there, infrastructure, voting rights, um, and uh, his restating of his strong position for funding the cops and so on and so forth. Uh, and then we have, of course, uh, also uh, our uh, discussion on the war in Iraq, I'm sorry, in the Ukraine. Uh, and our every week now we're doing questions from uh, our listening uh, audience and our party, uh, a mailbag. So who watched the State of the Union live? Anybody? Scott, I know you did. No, you're not, you're I don't not, watch speeches. You're not a watching kind of guy. What about I you, Michael? Did you watch it live? People. Yeah, I watched it live. Okay, Rosanna? No, I, I kind of have better things to do. <laughs> <laughs> I fell asleep. So, so, so what did you think, Michael? Was it a rousing speech that uh, Mr. Biden give? Well, when I hear State of the Union, I'm thinking of the 50 states. I'm thinking, okay, how is this country doing from the perspective of whatever presidents, you know, but he started with what's going on in Europe and expressed unconditional support, you know, for Ukraine and NATO. And, you know, I kind of expected that, um, but that was definitely a low point, you know, beating the drums of imperialist war. It was, you mentioned his position on um, funding the police. You know, of course our position is to defund the police, community control. And so that was another low point. I was also very surprised. This was his first um, State of the Union address since, since becoming president. And he did not mention January 6th at all. So I thought to, you know, downplay the fascist danger was a huge mistake. But, you know, if I'm being quite fair, I thought, you know, him calling for support uh, for voting rights, I think that was a plus. And uh, talking about infrastructure plan and jobs, that was a plus, but that's also part of, you know, the Democratic Party platform for the elections this year. And I think it was overshadowed, those two, I guess, high points were overshadowed by, you know, beating the drums of war and then making the outrageous claim that, you know, police need to be funded in order to take care of our communities. I thought that kind of, uh, that kind of ruined the whole thing, put a damper on it. It was kind of a centrist speech, uh, Rosanna. I mean, you know, he uh, maintained, you know, basic commitments to the Democratic Party's agenda, but he was responding defensively to some of the critiques of the uh, right wing, you know, that he's a socialist. So he had to say, I'm a capitalist. Did you hear that? And, 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 and then on the... Uh, defund issue. I'm for funding the police because there's still some members of the Democratic caucus in the House who uh, maintain that position. Uh, so um, you think he was right to do that, to reposition himself uh, to the political well, center, or, or was he too defensive, Rosanna? I, th I think, you know, um, I, I did listen to some of it, some of it afterwards, and it left me puzzled as to what the hell is he doing? Hmm. You know, ask, that, the question is, what is he doing? You know, we have the 22 elections and he seems to be, you know, playing a, a, a yes man to everybody and, you know, and not the working people, not the people that voted for him. And so I, you know, it, it's, to me, it's very, very concerning. It means, for, to me, it was that we've got to get out there in the streets and, and put pressure on him and uh, <clears throat> to continue our, the people's agenda, not the capitalist agenda. Scott, left center unity is important. We're not gonna win this election unless we are able to uh, win support of uh, people who are you know, not left wing or not right wing, but who are kind of in the independence and and uh, people 
I mean, wasn't he right to to respond in, in the way that he did? We have to think of, of unity uh, dialectically. It's, it's not just like left center unity, we bring them together and, and they're there and, and blah, it's a blah. It's a unity to do something, right? And this is a, a unity that's needed to um, defeat fascism, defeat the fascist threat and advance a people's agenda. So yes, we are gonna need to win, you know, uh, forces from, from the political center. Um, uh, but that doesn't mean, um, I, I think the forces from the political center are going to be forces, not ruling class forces necessarily from the center. We need to win over uh, a big chunk of the American people who are not um, on board yet with things like defund the police, with not with you know not on board with with abolishing NATO, we need to find a way to build, like find the things that can bring those people into the the progressive coalition and, and help it move forward. So no, I don't think that that um, turning away from a people's agenda and toward um, you know a more well a, a militaristic. Um, centrist, very typical uh, Democrat policy is, is, was the answer at all. Here's a lightning round. The Chamber of Commerce came out against Trump in the period between November the 4th and January the 20th, when Trump went mad dog crazy, along with uh, Giuliani and all the rest of them. So lightning round, the Chamber of Commerce of the United States of these Americas is part of the All People's Front. Michael, yes or no? Hello? I don't know if it's part of the All People's Front, but when institutions can be used in order to um, kind of avoid a setback or avoid a, um, a, an all fascist takeover, you know, whether it be in elections or whatever, even the Electoral College or some, you know, a, a reactionary um, uh, institution, you know, we, I think we should use it because that's what we have to deal with. That's all we have. I'm confused. Is that a yes or a no? It's not part of the all people's front because the chambers of the chamber is no. not people. It's okay. Not Rosanna, yes or no? Chamber of Commerce, all people's front. I think it all depends on what position they take. Okay, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> Abstain. Scott, yes or no? Um, before I answer that question, I need to know like, uh, the, the question of coming out, like they made a statement against, that doesn't mean anything to me. I want to know, like, they have resources. What did they do with them? Did they, have they withdrawn funding from candidates who supported January the 6th? Did they, you know, um, spend that money, like, reaching out to their membership? Okay, I'm going to have another lightning round. Attorney General Barr broke with Trump, said you're full of blankety blank, and resigned. Was he all part of all people's front, Scott? No, he's he's the sort of detritus that chips off of a, a crumbling edifice. Um, jumped, he's a rat, a rat, a rat jumping ship, ship. exactly. <laughs> or maybe a mouse. A mouse. <laughs> I know he's a pretty big. Jumping, for a... a mouse. The mouse jumped off the ship. Okay, so <laughs> let's see where 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 are we? Um, let's talk a little bit about. The war, the president spent 20 minutes of an hour long speech on the invasion of Ukraine um, and even threatened to, if you come across some of our NATO friends in Latvia and what are those other countries that join? Estonia. You know, huh? Estonia, Lithuania. Estonia. Let the, the Baltic states were coming at you. That was kind of a militaristic thing to do. Uh, don't you think, Rosanna? I mean, that was, I mean, when you, when you talk about war, you're talking about nuclear war in, in that sense, no? Yes, very much so. It's very, very concerning. You know, I know around, you know, my circles, people are worried. And, and you know, we got to, <clears throat> again fight back and and stop it it it's you know it's questionable as to what the hell's going <laughs> what the hell's wrong with him 
you know, <laughs> that's, I'm sorry, but that's the only thing I can, I can think of. He's just not, you know, he's not, uh, he's not being a good, even a good capitalist <laughs> or a good administrator, you know, we're defending. I just, he's just kind of going rogue and I don't know. I don't, I, it's very concerning. <clears throat> One of the things that we have to stress first off is that on Sunday, there are going to be demonstrations all over the country uh, against uh, the uh, wars in Europe and the uh, invasions and uh, calling for a pullback of uh, troops and ceasefire and addressing the NATO issue and so on and so forth. So we want to encourage everybody to uh, participate in, that, uh, in those demonstrations. We need, if we're going to have a progressive policy at home, we need a democratic progressive policy uh, abroad. <clears throat> but Scott, so how do we deal with this issue? I mean, you know, Russia invaded and well, uh, we're well, not supporting I mean, that, are we? Th that's a very, th there's a, a very normal bourgeois trick of, of taking the most recent um, event and, and, and making that the, the beginning of, of the whole story. Um, NATO has been um, doing one of its sort of low key uh, invasion occupations, moving closer and closer to Russia's borders for years. Um, a, a, a force that is openly hostile to Russia, you know, placing weapons closer and closer to, to Russia's borders. This was not some sort of unprovoked aggression by, um, by Putin. That said, it was an act of aggression. It was an invasion of, of Ukraine. Um, and we certainly don't, you know, condone or, or support that either, um, at least as far as I'm uh, concerned. Um, the, 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 the question, I guess, for me, in, in terms of Biden's State of the Union and what's happening here is I'm confused by the amount of power we seem to be able to, we, we the United States, um, I shouldn't say we, they, the ruling class of the United States seem to be able to wield um, everywhere else around the world, freezing assets, sanctions, declaring this or that government illegitimate. Um, and yet, you know, when it comes to making progress here in this country, it's always our hands are tied. Oh, we'd like to, you know, combat voter suppression. We'd like to, you know, um, make a transition to a green. Our hands are tied. We can't. It's bullshit. It's bullshit. Like I want to see, um, you know, find the the people who are uh, suppressing the vote in in uh, Georgia, the one here, not not the other one, and in Texas, and attempting to do it in Pennsylvania. Seize like freeze their assets. I don't know. I, that's that's the thing for me that, that that's really frustrating. Like all the power in the world to, you know, for imperialism and absolute the the claim of absolute powerlessness here at home. Well, what should be done uh, then to address these different? You know, I mean, on the one hand, you had a de facto uh, NATOization of the Ukraine, and even Trump, Michael. Uh, he was supposed to be such a big friend of Putin, but at the same time, he was arming the regime in Ukraine. And also calling for NATO to not exist as it currently does. He thought it was a waste of money and that Germany and France weren't paying their part. So he was all over the place. Uh, was he all uh, over the place or was he playing a masterful game? I think he was playing a, a, a maybe a, a different game, let's say. But also, <laughs> I, I don't understand what he was doing either. I agree with Rosanna, but I, I agree with Scott's analysis. You know, these uh, the two people's republics of mostly ethnic, you know, Russian speaking people, um, you know, have been shelled by the Ukrainians since 2014. You know, does that justify a Russian uh, invasion? You know, I'm not going to go there. You know, we're for peace, you know, because it's only Russian and uh, Ukrainian um, working people who are suffering the consequences of this war. Um, so we have to be for peace. You know, we have we stand against uh, NATO aggression, you know, and we do that by demanding peace because they've been the biggest aggressor, you know, since the end of the Second World War, you know. And so I think that's just what we have to keep demanding. Those people being arrested in the streets of Russia, 
uh, for demanding peace. There's people fleeing um, fascism, you know, the 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 at the the Azov Brigade and and so forth battalion, and they're they're leaving Ukraine and they're going to other you know right wing uh, oriented countries like Poland and, and and Hungary where things aren't much better. You know, there's there's images of um, African immigrants living in Ukraine fleeing to these other Eastern European countries with right wing governments, and they're being turned away or they're being you know beaten at the border. And so it's just a mess all around. It's a mess all around. And I think we have to look at the entire picture of this because um, as, as Scott says, it's very easy to say, oh, Russia invaded, so they're the bad guys. But we really have to look at, at this uh, kind of um, from all, all directions, all sides. And it, it's interesting to note as well that when, when Zelensky was elected in 2019, um, he, he, was not, he was not brought to power by this coup in, in, in 2014. That was a, a different president um, when Zelensky was elected, it was, a, it was a pretty big victory, right? He won, I think, 30% of the vote in the first round and then 73% in, in a runoff. And his major campaign promise was peace, peace with Russia, um, peace with Russia and, and you know, stopping oligarchs from pillaging the, the state. Um, and there were actually moves toward peace in his first year. Um, meetings and the beginning of, of some joint projects and, and looking for a, a democratic um, you know, and diplomatic solution to the question of, of Donbass and, and you know, the rights of, of ethnic Russians um, on territory that Ukraine claims. But that all kind of went to shit. Um, and the you know, extreme anti-Russian, ultra-nationalist fascist forces um, you know, kept gaining power. Um, the democratic reforms that were supposed to happen did not. Um, our party was not, um, you know, unbanned. It was not allowed to, it did not have its right to run candidates uh, granted. Um, so it's, what that tells me is that there is a, a desire on the part of a large section of the Ukrainian people uh, for peace um, and not for peace on NATO's terms. Um, uh, and that, you know, NATO is is largely responsible for for the persistence and the growth of this extreme right and fascist threat in Ukraine. What about the self determination issue, though? Uh, we had a meeting the other night, Scott, and you raised that question because you say that Zelensky didn't come to power, which is true uh, as a result of the events that took place, which were actually a coup in 2014, but he came to power within the framework of that political dispensation. Um, so how do you handle the self-determination issue so in that respect? There are overlapping, two overlapping questions, right? So self-determination is a property of, of nations. Um, and, and sovereignty is a property of states. Um, so it's one thing to talk about respecting the sovereignty of Ukraine, the, the, the right of Ukraine to chart its own course, and another to talk about the self-determination of um, national groups within uh, Ukraine. Um, and, you know, democracy demands both of those things. Um, uh, the, the people of um, the breakaway republics, you know, they, they exercised uh, a right of self-determination. Um, was that, was, I'm gonna say self-determination doesn't, doesn't mean separation necessarily. It means um, the, that a nation chooses on what terms um, it will uh, be part of some, some larger grouping. So, Again, I, I think that NATO's aggression in Ukraine very probably pushed the question of self-determination for Russians uh, in Ukraine um, towards separatism rather than toward, you know, integration into a, a peaceful, democratic, multinational state. Um, so. Ukraine's sovereign, the, the sovereignty of Ukraine needs to be respected and the right of self-determination for the people in, um, in Donbass. 
Well, it sounds all, it's all kind of complicated and confused to me because Ukraine exercised self-determination in the 20th century when they joined the Union of Soviet Soviet Republics, no? True? Rosanna, didn't that happen? I read that somewhere. And then um, Yeltsin, Gorbachev came to power, him and Yeltsin dissolved the Soviet Union. And then they had a referendum and everybody voted to stay in and they ignored it. And then, uh, but they did it anyway. So what happened to the self-determination? Yeah. And then, uh, what was the name of the leader of the Ukraine after that? He got overthrown. Um, and, and then these other people came into power. Is this all? I think that's why it's key for, for us to always take a look at things in its entirety, you know, because our, our, our go-to right now is to say, well, who's the bad guy and who's the good guy? And there isn't any in this case, you know, they're not, they're not for the working people. They're not for, for meeting people's needs. Therefore, you know, who's going to get the bigger pot of gold? And so I think that that's, you know, that's what makes it, I think, sometimes even more complicated is that, wait a minute, you know, you get confused because your instinct is to say, I'm going to be for the good guys. But in this case, there isn't a good guys. And so now you have to really fully explain it and deep, dig deeper and, and do a, 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 you know, a thorough research to really understand what's going on and determine what, as working people, what is our step? And I think our step is get out there on Sunday in mass, you know, really drop what you were doing on Sunday and get out there in the streets to show the American people do not want war. We're tired of it. We, you know, we want that money to be spent on childcare and healthcare and affordable housing, all of those kinds of things. Good point. Michael, summarize quickly. What is the Communist Party's position on this invasion and the response to it? We're calling for peace, as Rosanna said. Um, you know, we have a wonderful statement up on the cpusa.org. No war on Ukraine, no war on Russia, end to NATO uh, imperialist aggression. And that's the position we maintain. And, I, you know, quite frankly, I think that's the correct position to have, because as Rosanna says, we don't need to make excuses for the fascist battalions in the Ukrainian army. We're, no, we're certainly against that. But we're also certainly against the reactionary right wing politics of the Putin regime. You know, our uh, the Communist Party in Russia is in opposition uh, to Putin's United Russia Party. We have to remember that. We have to remember that. And because there's so many claims out there that, you know, Putin's a communist, he's rebuilding the Soviet Union. And so we have to, you know, refutate those claims. And as Rosanna says, really do the research and come out in favor of peace, because that's what working people need here and abroad. But isn't the Russian party supporting the invasion? The Russian party supporting the invasion in the context that it's going to denazify Ukraine. They are not in favor of, however, of uh, the expansion of the old Russian empire or whatever else. I just can't get over how Putin sits at, when he gives his speeches at the desk, he has the old Russian flag, you know, from, from before the, the Soviet uh, revolution. And it's kind of like, it's the same flag that the Romanov family had flying up there. So it's like, and, you But know, that's his whole deal. <laughs> he sees yeah. himself as like this historical synthesis of, of the Romanovs and Stalin, right? You had, you know, the, the, the monarchical empire and then you had the, the greatness of you know the soviet union he's the that third term that synthesis that's gonna it's a ridiculous um, oh i don't know how you guys get inside putin's head i ain't trying to go to there <laughs> all i know is that the man by his practice is uh representing the interest of the ruling capitalist forces in russia mind you i said capitalist i didn't use the word oligarch because I don't like that word unless you're going to use it for the capitalists in the United States, the capitalists in the UK, France, uh, and all, you know what I'm trying to say. So, no, and he's, uh, he's, he's a nationalist and he's pursuing the national interest of that country or what they perceive to be of the national interest of that class of the newly emerging 
Russian ruling class, who, by the way, looted the country. They looted the country. They took socialist state property and they and they robbed the, the, the Russian working class. So, I mean, let's be clear uh, about what uh, happened. And so uh, that that's a big uh, motive behind what they're doing uh, in the Ukraine. And so our position has to be to support the workers of Ukraine and people to support the workers uh, of Russia and the people. And on, on that basis, to build a peace movement in the United States to compel Rosanna, the Biden administration, to stop its de facto nativization of Ukraine, pull back uh, so that these questions can be solved in a peaceful way. And I think the third parties had to be brought in uh, via the United Nations and others to help mediate that thing. Otherwise, we're going to be in big, 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 big trouble. And don't forget um, the working class here, Joe. Say what? Because, and don't forget the working class here, because this war is going to be a source of misery and ruin for us, too. Um, it means giving up any kind of progress on, on all sorts of things. Absolutely right. Which brings us to a question from our mailbag of the week about socialism in these United States of America. And the person writes to follow. He says, hey, Michael, hey, Scott, hey, Rosanna, you wrote that American socialism will be an American party system. But even Lenin wrote that the most important thing in a socialist state is one party rule and a single direction of the development of the party and state. A single direction because there is the possibility of opportunism and revisionism. How is it possible to have a multi-party system? What are y'all talking about? <laughs> I think it, it's important to remember that Marxism is a science, it's not a dogma. You know, In chapter two of the manifesto, which is written in 1848, Marx said that communists aren't supposed to form their own party. They're supposed to be in the old social democratic workers' parties. That's what he wrote. And then Lenin went on, you know, and what is to be done and called for the establishment of a revolutionary working class party, right? Um, and so and then we see countries like China. We see countries like uh, uh, the DPRK, even the old GDR. Those were not one party states. They, you know, the communist party played the leading role, let's say, but they were coalition government, our coalition government still. And so, you know, we think about how American people and, and the fight for democracy here, you hear demands for more representation, more parties, right? That's a big complaint, a big complaint we have even in the center. You know, people say, we need another party, we need another party. So if we come in and we say, oh, we only need one, you know, that's probably not a great look for all these people, you know, calling for, for uh, the, part, the, the system to be expanded, you know, and so forth. And so, well, of course, we're in favor of coalitions. Um, we envision, you know, the, the socialism in, in this country as being a, a, a coalition of forces coming together, the anti-monopoly coalition of which the Communist Party will play a leading role and so forth. But just to say it's going to be one party, I'm not sure um, that's how it would look here in the United States. I don't think that's what Americans would go for. And it's not that way in China and other socialist countries. Multi-party or one party, Rosanna? I think the people of the United States will determine that when we get there. That's, you know. I'm, I'm more of a here and now person, so I, I don't can't take too much time to think about those things because we don't know. We don't know what's going to happen. You know, maybe the people are ready for a one party. Maybe they're not. But let's let's move forward with with, you know, what's happening today. Scott, multi party or one party? Um, I suspect it'll be multi party, but um, I think we have to, you know, see, find like what was Lenin getting at in, in what he was saying? And it's true that um, the existence of multiple parties um, can be a tool used by reactionaries, used by the, the capitalist class to um, prevent progress, to tie things up in, in you know, useless disagreements. And um, you know, I, I suspect socialism here will be a, a, a multi-party system. 
but it will be a multi-party system of the working class, not um, you know, a party representing the capitalist class and another party representing the workers. And it, it'll be multiple working class parties. Oh, like Cuba has um, not so much parties, but um, kind of um, uh, political and social blocks like the, the women's movement and the youth and student movement and the trade union movement um, are all, they all play a, a political role, but they're, you know, they're, they're all working class entities. What if that one party is a revisionist party? Are you gonna be in trouble? Because that's what happened with Gorbachev. That's <laughs> the first thing. Second thing is, I don't know that Lenin ever said no shit like that. I know that when the Bolshevik revolution took place, it was a multi-party state. The socialist revolutionaries participated, didn't they? Or did I get my history lesson wrong? Others participated. And it was only during the Civil War when they went over to the side of the whites, I don't mean white people, I mean, <laughs> I mean the, 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 the counter-revolutionary forces that they decided that, hey, we need to consolidate because we, we're facing counter-revolution. So that was the history, uh, the short history of the USSR up to and through the uh, Civil War. Uh, Multi-party, definitely, we have to stand for that. That has to be our position and the fight for position, political position has to take place within that working class dispensation, within that working class framework. That does it for this week's edition of Good Morning Revolution. Until next week, everybody, stay strong, stay safe and stay in the fight. Have a great weekend, everybody. See you Thanks later. So much. Bye.